Hi, engineers. In this video today, we're going to be talking about the diencephalon. But before we get started in this lecture, I want to point out to you my new sweatshirt. Check it out. Look at it. It's got Nintendo on the sleeve. This is our new merchandise. So if you want to check it out, it's in the link down below. And if you do like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's get started with diencephalon. We've been going through our neuro series, and so far we've done videos on two so far. We've done video on our cerebrum, and we've done a video on our cerebellum. So now to talk about the diencephalon, we're going to just look at this diagram really quickly, orient ourselves as to what the diencephalon does look like on a 2D model. I do suggest that if you have a chance to see a 3D model, to really understand it and see the, the structure and how it all looks in there, then please go check it out. Whether it's a video of the 3D model, of a dissectable model, we do have it on our Ninja Nerd page, you can go check it out. Or if you have one in your anatomy lab. But anyways, let's orient ourselves on this and then we're going to talk about the function of each part of the diencephalon. So first right here, we are looking at this whole diagram and we have our anterior portion here, our posterior portion here, and then we have our brain cut in half so we can kind of see the middle here and we can see what's going on with the brain stem and the diencephalon. So let's orient ourselves even further. This pink structure right here is our cerebrum. We have our structure back here in this darker blue, which is our cerebellum. And we've dedicated already a video for each structure, the cerebrum and the cerebellum. In the future, we're going to have one on our brain stem here, which consists of our midbrain, our pons, and our medulla oblongata. And now we're going to focus in a little bit more on these structures here in the middle. These are going to be the new to us structures that we haven't learned about yet, which is our diencephalon. So the two structures that we're going to talk about right now, this big arching pink thing right here is called our corpus callosum. And what is our corpus callosum? Corpus callosum is this structure here, this pink structure that you can see. It is white matter, and what it allows is our right cerebral hemisphere and our left cerebral hemisphere to talk to each other. So it's these nerve fiber tracts that are going to allow all this different communication to cross through between the different hemispheres. Underneath that is this darker brownish red color here, and we call this the fornix. The fornix is also white matter. It allows for different types of communication as well. And then we have our area that we really want to talk about right in here, which is our diencephalon. So down here is the same drawing as up here. We're going to talk about both so we just understand a little bit of orientation. So right here, this big blue structure here, we have a thalamus. Underneath it, we have our hypothalamus. Okay, so far so good. Hanging off of the hypothalamus, we have this little gland right here, which is our pituitary gland. Back here on the back portion of the thalamus, we have something called the epithalamus. And I always picture this as like a hat sitting on the back of the thalamus. So this is our epithalamus. This red structure right here is our pineal gland. And then the last structure we need to identify is this green portion right here, which is our subthalamus. So now we understand basically the orientation. We can look at that here a little bit nicer, a little more blown up, a little more clear for us. So right here across the top is the fornix. Then we have our thalamus, our hypothalamus with our pituitary gland. We have our subthalamus right here. And then we have our epithalamus with our pineal gland. Now that we understand a little bit of the orientation, let's go and talk about the function of each one of these. There are four, really six main structures that we're going to talk about right now that compose the diencephalon. We already touched on them, right? We had the thalamus, the hypothalamus with the pituitary gland, the epithalamus with the pineal gland, and the subthalamus. Now we're just going to touch on what their function and a little more information about them. First, we're going to talk about the thalamus. There's actually two thalami. And as we look here at an anterior view, we can actually see that there's two of them. And an area in the middle here that when you look at the dissectable model, or if you look at any other drawing that's a lot better than it's just a 2D flat model, you'll be able to see that this space in the middle here is actually where our third ventricle is. So we have two thalami, right, and they are composed of gray matter. 
And this gray matter is essentially very, very dense nucleus in order, or nuclei, in order for their communication to occur. So why does the thalamus need all this dense nuclei for communication? It's because the thalamus is known also as the relay station or the area in which we take messages in and then we send them out. So I always like to think of it as more of like a post office. We're taking a lot of information in, a lot of letters in, and then we're gonna send them to where they need to go. So the thalamus works as our relay station. What this means is that it's going to allow the cerebrum to decide on certain information that's coming in, you know, it's gonna come in, get this information, it's gonna say, okay, this is more focused on here, we need to focus on this, and we need to not talk about one of these or not worry about this information that's coming in. So it's gonna help basically prioritize and organize that information that's coming in. So what kind of information is a thalamus relaying or sending out to its different areas? Things like temperature, things like touch, uh, things like pain, right? So all of that is going to be helped regulated by the thalamus. Then we can move on to the hypothalamus, right? So we talked about the thalamus, which is right here in the middle. We can talk about the hypothalamus, the area that's underneath the thalamus. And if we look at the hypothalamus, one of the main functions of the hypothalamus is homeostasis. So when we're talking about homeostasis with the hypothalamus, we're talking about different functions that are going to help keep balance within our body. Some of those things that can be balanced by our body by the hypothalamus is our body's temperature, our thirst, our hunger, and also a little bit of our sleep-wake cycles. The hypothalamus also plays a part in our autonomic nervous system, which we know is our involuntary control of things like our heart rate, our blood pressure. So we want to make sure that we understand that homeostasis not only meaning regulation of what our body is doing for needs, our basic uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it also has to do with our involuntary as well, okay? So involuntary things like our heart rate and our blood pressure. But we can't talk about homeostasis and the hypothalamus without talking about the pituitary gland. So inferior to our hypothalamus, through this little thing right here called our infundibulum or our pituitary stalk, Underneath is our pituitary gland, and there's actually two lobes to the pituitary gland, an anterior and a posterior. And the pituitary gland, we should understand, it's a gland, so we should know that it has to do with hormones. What kind of hormones is pituitary gland really, really focusing on? Different things like our follicular stimulating hormone, our luteinizing hormone, our prolactin, our oxytocin, our thyroid stimulating hormone, and our growth hormone, one of the biggest ones, growth hormone. So now that we understand that the hypothalamus is our area of homeostasis that has also the pituitary gland that does a lot of regulation of hormones, we can understand that there is a lot going on within this very, very minute portion of the diencephalon deep within the center of our brain. Now we can also talk about the epithalamus, also that has the pineal gland. So this is one of my favorite parts of the diencephalon because I, like I said before, I think it looks like a hat with this like little red ball in the back of it. But the epithalamus and the pineal gland are essentially an area that is really in tuned with our sleep-wake cycle. And that has to do with the pineal gland. It's a gland, so more than likely gonna be reducing, producing a hormone. The pineal gland produces melatonin. What is melatonin? Melatonin is a hormone that we take in, or that we create in order for us to sleep. So think about at night when you, you hear all those stories about people. You shouldn't be looking at screens at night because you're not going to be able to sleep or, you know, I don't know, I can't fall asleep. So you're just sitting on your computer or sitting on your phone or sitting on your iPad. That is producing light. Light coming into the eye is not allowing our body to be aware that it's you know, dark outside. So we have this circadian rhythm that we want to fall asleep. And when we have darkness come along, our body says, okay, it's time to get ready for sleep. Let's get ready. And it starts to produce melatonin. So that all comes from the pineal gland. And lastly, we have this little area right here, our subthalamus. It's right here underneath our thalamus. You can see it's sub. It's not portion here of the orange, which is our hypothalamus, but over here in this area. And when we talk about the subthalamus, the most important portion of 
This function is just motor control, motor functioning, understanding you know, where we are, what our body is doing and moving. Okay, Ninja Nerds, that is the video on diencephalon. I hope you liked it. I hope you got something from this. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.